Hello, my name is Llewellyn and I'm studying for a PhD in English at the University of Oxford. More specifically, I research medieval English and Celtic languages and how the world sounded according to medieval literature. But I'm here to tell you today that studying English literature isn't just about studying English. It is studying all types of literature and in all sorts of languages, even those you may not even know yet. By using the tools you already have, and some that are easy to pick up, you can access new ways of seeing the world. So today we will be reading Britain's languages from the Middle Ages and from the modern day. Our objectives for today then are to familiarise ourselves with the Middle Ages and with medieval English, to think about the different languages of Britain today and in the medieval period, especially Welsh, and to think about what it means when these languages interact. Now, I've mentioned a few times by now the Middle Ages and the medieval period, but what do I mean by this? Now, this is an important question for this session, so uh, we better make sure we know what we're talking about. Here's a quick fire task then to start us off and warm us up. When were the Middle Ages? There are a few clues on the presentation there. And what happened during the Middle Ages? By the way, with each task, I'll be asking you to pause the video to give you some time to think about your answers. There will be shorter tasks where maybe a minute's pause will do, and some longer ones where you might need a bit more time. This one's a short one, so pause for, say, a minute to think about what you know about the Middle Ages. When is that period? And can you think of any famous events or people that belong to it? Traditionally, we call the Middle Ages the period in the middle between the fall of the Roman Empire in around 476 of the Common Era and the beginning of the modern period at the end of the 15th century. What we mean by this is that the Middle Ages happened after the Roman Empire's power disintegrated, at least in Western Europe. And that's an important point, by the way. Usually the Middle Ages is simply a convenient and subjective label for a period of history in Western Europe that is really relevant to the history of other parts of the world. And the Middle Ages was also before the modern period. Now this was signalled by two important events. The Protestant Reformation was one of them, and this was instigated by Martin Luther in continental Europe, which later inspired Henry VIII in Britain. For some context, before this, all Christians were more or less Catholics who worshipped under the authority of the Pope. But Martin Luther thought this form of worship was not only untrue, but also unfair on most Christians who were not allowed to read the Bible and so could not have direct access to God. That was the first event of the dawn of the modern period. The second was the invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany, and this increased literacy massively ultimately allowing more people to be educated and to seek social reform. So the Middle Ages was between these two bookends. What about the important events? Perhaps you thought of uh, the Norman Conquest and the Battle of Hastings in 1066, or the Vikings, or the Battle of Bosworth and the rise of the Tudor dynasty. Um, maybe some saints, St. Patrick was around in the very early Middle Ages. And maybe some important documents such as the Doomsday Book or the Magna Carta. Maybe some of you even mentioned the Canterbury Tales. Now then, we're going to look at this in a bit more detail in the next slide. This is the first task proper of the session, where we are going to read medieval English, particularly the first four lines of the Canterbury Tales by a poet called Geoffrey Chaucer. Now, the Canterbury Tales come from the 14th century, which is certainly in the Middle Ages, and so does this manuscript copy. And I make that distinction because although Geoffrey Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, he didn't write the copies that have survived to this day. In fact, it was fairly rare for authors to write down their own tales and poems, and even if they did, they hardly ever signed their name at the start or at the bottom. Nonetheless, we can tell that whoever wrote the co this copy of the Canterbury Tales was wealthy. Um, we can do though just by looking at it. 
it's made of vellum to begin with, and vellum wasn't cheap to produce. We can also tell from the beautifully ornate drawings that are around the first few lines. Um, you can see the lovely little swirls and the colours of blue and red and gold. But even the text, it is very neatly written and you can see those nice little strokes. It's all very tidy. These are not some cheap scribblings. But what are the Canterbury Tales? Maybe you've heard of them or studied them at school. In essence, they are a fascinating collection of all sorts of stories, romance and myth, history and satire, and they are told by people from all walks of life. And this was key and quite uncommon, and mo as most literature at the time was written by rich men, about rich men, for rich men. But here we have paupers, merchants, cooks, knights, nuns, and, and a healthy mixture of men and women. So it was pretty groundbreaking at the time, and today in some ways. Regardless, here are the opening four lines in which the author sets the beautiful springtide scene before he zooms in to describe the characters that will feature in the tales. Pause the video for a few minutes to see how much of this medieval text in this medieval manuscript you can read. Are there some words that you recognise? Are there some words that you don't recognise but you can make out some individual letters. All will be revealed in the next slide, but have a go. How was that? Well, if you manage to get even a few words, excellent, you can now read a 700 year old manuscript. Well done. Here then is a transcription of what it says on the right, and a version in modern English on the left. I'll read the original just so that you can get a sense of how Middle English sounded. When that April with his assured suit, the drocht of March perched to the root, and bathed every vein in switch liqueur, of which fair to engender is the floor. However, just like today, today English wasn't the only language of Britain in the Middle Ages. It was home to many different cultures and many different languages. Here's another quickfire task for you then. How many languages can you name? Each colour corresponds to a language, including the squares and the one big square across all the islands. Some of these are dead languages today. Some have evolved into modern forms. Some are still alive and well, but are no longer spoken in Britain and Britain Island. There are 10 in total. See how you get on. Good, well, here we are. Let's go from English in the middle and then go clockwise around. So we have English in England. No points for getting that one right. Welsh in Wales. Irish or Irish Gaelic in Ireland, the green bits, but note that there are also some pink bits there, which is the English. Up in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, Scottish Gaelic was spoken, which is another Celtic language. In the lowlands of Scotland, however, where Edinburgh and Glasgow and other cities are today, Scots was spoken. Scots is uh, not a Celtic language, it is a, a heavy dialect of English, or perhaps even a separate language, but it is a heavily inflected form of English. In the northeast of England, we had Norse. Now the Norse was the language of the Vikings who came into Britain on that coast, and uh, the northeastern coast and spread throughout uh, Britain. Uh, Norse today is the language that has evolved into uh, languages like Danish and Icelandic and Norwegian and Swedish. In the southeast there, that blue square is French. Now French was the most important language of Britain for centuries. It was the language of royalty and of legal proceedings and all sorts of important social strata, particularly in the upper echelons of society. Um, in the southwest of England, you had Cornish, which is yet another Celtic language um, there in Cornwall and Devon. And there's one little language left, which is in the island between Britain and Ireland, which is the Isle of Man. And there we have Manx, 
which is uh, the final Celtic language spoken in Britain and Ireland. And of course, the last one spoken all over Britain and Ireland and indeed all over Europe in the Middle Ages was Latin. Latin, the living language of the church, of the law, and the international language of royalty, the aristocracy and commerce. It was absolutely everywhere. And here's an interesting fact. All of these languages are related. What do I mean by this? Well, let's take a look in the next slide. If you go back far enough, all of the languages I just mentioned came from the same language. And this is true for most of the languages of Europe and some from Central and South Asia even today. And this is where we get the term Indo-European from. These are the Indo-European languages, the language, languages of Europe all the way over to India. Indo-European. All of these languages here on the screen in this little diagram have a common ancestor. They all have lots and lots in common, but some have even more in common with each other than with others. And this is how we form these little subgroups. Welsh, for example, is a Celtic language in the top left there, meaning it has more in common with other Celtic languages like Irish than with, say, English, which is a Germanic language. English, in turn, has more in common with other Germanic languages like Swedish and German than with, say, Russian or Latvian. And we can test this connection by looking at individual words. Often, if we look at an individual word across the languages of the Indo-European family tree, we can see that they are very similar. However, once we go to a language that is not an Indo-European language, like Korean, for example, we see that it is not similar. So let's look at the number three, for example, in Welsh, Latin, German, Spanish and Hindi. It goes three, three, tres, trai, tres, tin. But then in Korean, se, which is vastly different. It's important to bear in mind this ancestral connection between the languages of medieval Britain, particularly when we encounter ones we don't know. Now, we've encountered an unfamiliar form of a language that we all know, Middle English, but what about one of the languages on that map of medieval Britain? An entirely unfamiliar language like Welsh. When you encounter an unfamiliar language, instead of panicking, just remember that all that's in front of you are symbols for sound. The same is true for any written language on the planet, regardless of the alphabet or script it uses. What's on the page is just a way of representing the sounds of that language. Welsh, for example, uses the same writing system as English, but with some slight differences. Firstly, there are one or two letters that are different. Some exist in Welsh that don't insist in English and vice versa. Can you spot the differences? Pause for a few minutes and then we'll look at them together. So the five English letters that don't appear in Welsh are K, Q, V, X and Z. And the eight letters that are unique to Welsh are CH, double D, double F, NG, double L, PH, RH and TH. But how do they sound? Because the other difference is that some of the letters, even though they look the same, actually represent different sounds. Here is the Welsh alphabet, the sounds that these symbols represent when they are representing the Welsh language. What's good about this is that once you have this, you can read Welsh. And so here is your second task, reading modern Welsh. For example, with this table, you can now read the Welsh word for Wales. Pause for a minute or two to try out these sounds, then try and say the Welsh word for Wales. Exactly, the Welsh for Wales is pronounced Cymru. What about this one? This is the highest mountain in South Wales, which you may have visited or might do in the future. How is it pronounced? Have a go. Yes, we pronounce this Pen-y-van. 
And the truth is, you can now even read Llanfair Pwllgwyngyllt o Gerach Wyn Drobl Llant Ysgilio Go Go Goch. Before our final task, in which we look at languages mixing, perhaps it is a good time to ask, what is language? Well, is it replacing one word for another? Is it different sound labels for the same things? Is it grammar? Well, none of these provides a satisfying answer on their own. Language is all of this and so much more. Language is about possibility. It's about different windows onto the world. That's what the German philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein had in mind when he said, the limit of my language and the limit of my world. That is to say, you cannot think about anything without thinking about it in the language you have available to you. So each language and its speakers sees the world differently. This is important when we consider the languages we discussed today, especially when they interact. This then is our final task, reading medieval Welsh with hints of medieval English. Not only is this an unfamiliar language, but an unfamiliar language from the past. Here are four lines from a 15th century poem describing the wonderful items on sale in a market at Oswestry, a town in Shropshire on the border between England and, England and Wales. You now know not to panic when you see something like this and to appreciate that all this is is a collection of symbols for sounds. What's more is that with Welsh, you now know how to make those sounds. You can go back and check the table in the previous few slides if you like. Just like we did with the Middle English of the Canterbury Tales and the modern Welsh of those place names, see if you can decipher the sounds represented in this poem. Furthermore, see if you can spot any English words, because some of the words here are related to, or are even borrowed from, English. This may only become clearer once you've managed to read the words out loud, so pause for a few minutes and have a go. How did you get on? Well, I'll read the original to you and see how it compares to what you came up with. On the right, you'll also see the English translation. Cestiae da in costio dierth, cumin, box, cain wien heb werth, sugar, sarsned, felved, afan, ship said and shop sidan. Did you also spot some words that were very similar to English words? How about sugar for sugar, felved for velvet, or cumin for cumin, which are all English loanwords? Or how about kistiai and wien, which have the same common ancestor as English chests and wine? As a final supplementary question, think about what this might tell us about the items in this poem and what it might tell us about the English and Welsh languages at this point in time. Loan words tend to occur when there is no word for that particular item in the target language, and so its original word stays with it as it travels. Think of baguette, burrito, or tipi. Moreover, loan words tend to travel most freely between languages that are in close contact. So have a think. From that rather large question, which we've extrapolated from looking at something in detail, we see that we've come to the end of the session. And so, in summary, we have seen today that studying English literature does not by any means limit you to studying English. We've learned that Britain has always been multilingual. And lastly, we've realised that written language is just symbols for the sounds of that language. However, the language itself contains a unique way of understanding the world. Now, if you'd like to learn more about Chaucer or Welsh or medieval languages, you can look at these resources here, including the Oxford for East England's website. I particularly recommend looking at the Ellesmere manuscript copy of the Canterbury Tales. That is a work of art. I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you very much.